Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. The Anarcho-Christian Podcast, evaluating the relationship between the Christian and the state. His life's work had been to help the people understand It's not the role of a man to rule over other men Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Have you ever been in a conversation about capitalism and socialism, or voluntarism and communism, how all these things relate to us as Christians, and which principle is more in line with the Bible, to then run into these verses in the New Testament that use the phrase, all things in common. It's typically brought up in support of communism, and on its surface seems like a very strong argument. So today, I'd like to visit those passages in the book of Acts to go over exactly what it says and what holding all things in common means. All right, like I said, the phrase comes from the New Testament book of Acts. To set the context, the book of Acts also known as the Acts of the Apostles, takes place after the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is widely accepted that it was authored by Luke, the same author of the Gospel of Luke. My Apologetic Study Bible contains information about each book, and a portion of the Acts introduction puts it this way. Although the book is technically anonymous, Strong evidence points to Luke as the author. Tradition holds that he wrote Acts as a sequel to his gospel, and that the two should be read together. Indeed, many scholars refer to Luke's work as a single entity, uh, written out Luke-Acts. This is supported by the opening paragraph of Acts, where the author refers to a first narrative written to Theophilus presumed to be Luke's gospel, in Luke 1, 1 1-4. Although some of the material in Acts was no doubt collected from different sources by Luke, much of the material comes from his own experiences traveling with Paul. Indeed, Irenaeus, AD 130-200, was the first to point out the many instances in Acts where the point of view changes from he and they to we implying that the author himself was there with Paul during those periods. These are commonly referred to as the we passages. So, by the way, I recommend the Apologetic Study Bible for you other bibliophiles. It has a ton of extra content written by Bible scholars dealing with archaeology and presumed contradictions. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. So, as the intro states, Luke 1, 1 1-4 says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And Acts starts out chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to his apostles, whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, 
which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Luke then describes the ascension of Jesus and the replacement of Judas in the Twelve. Chapter 2 takes us to the day of Pentecost, where we see the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the controversial event of speaking in tongues, where people in the crowd were miraculously able to hear the gospel spoken in their native languages, and Peter proclaims that this was the fulfillment of a prophecy from Joel. Side note, throughout the New Testament, the apostles, with wisdom from the Holy Spirit, are constantly pointing out all the prophecies from the Old Testament that were speaking of events that find their fulfillment in Christ. And this event is even believed to be a unique fulfillment of what happened with the Tower of Babel, where God confused the languages of man at Babel. Here we have him miraculously uniting the languages again for the sake of the gospel, therefore being understood in every language for every person, and that it will not just be for one language and one people group. So it's taken a little while to get here, but I really think the context is important. The passages about all things in common come up right after Pentecost. Chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 states, And they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So did you catch that? All who believed had everything in common, and it looks like that means they were selling all their possessions and belongings and distributing their proceeds to all based on their needs. Chapter 3 has an account of Peter and John healing a man that couldn't walk from birth, and Peter preaches the gospel to the witnesses and calls for them to repent. Chapter 4 sees the apostles arrested for preaching and then released, and then ends with another reference to the believers living with everything in common. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5 continues with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It says they sold their property, but only brought a part of the proceeds to the apostles. Verse 3-5 through five says, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. 
So three hours later, Ananias' wife, Sapphira, comes in, having no knowledge of what happened to her husband. And Peter asks her to confirm how much they sold the land for. She confirms the same amount that Ananias lied about, and she falls down dead as well. So here is where we have the case for Christian communism. Between these few chapters, we have a few references to everyone living in common, and even a couple of people dying for apparently not giving completely. Well, that's the position. However, as you probably know by now, this is not my position. We've already addressed an article from Lawrence Reed questioning and answering the narrative of Jesus being a socialist. If you haven't heard it or read the article, I will have links to both the article and the previous episode in the show notes. But this episode is just addressing this particular objection. Was this a form of communism? And even an example that advocates for the death penalty of those that do not participate. Unfortunately, that is the way it's presented by those that hold to Christian communism or even anarcho-communism. There are a bunch of distinctions we can get into between these groups, but for the sake of brevity, I'll just refer to the positions as communists from this point. So, in case you run into this objection, let's answer it. First of all, we see a voluntary selling of all the possessions, belongings, and land. Now, this might be something a socialist or communist says they support, but there is a reason why there is a distinction between them and a voluntarist. A voluntarist believes in private property ownership and supports the idea of selling it for whatever price the owner names, be it a loss, breaking even, or for profit. This lines up with the text we've read. The property was voluntarily sold, not coercively taken from the owners. It was also sold, meaning someone else now owned it. Again, going against the communist philosophy of the legitimacy of private property and even the abolition of money, which is likely what's referenced in the proceeds. Taking a minute to look at the way this plays out in both noted events, we see something very different than that of the communist. And I know I'm going to get a lot of hate from people who try to rationalize socialism communism, or syndicalism, with some definition that sounds like voluntarism. However, in any case, from any supporter or notable philosopher I've found, violence and coercion is always, eventually, supported to create or maintain this society. And that is the sticking point for me. If you're going to assume the monopoly on violence to ensure your version of a perfect society, well, that's neither anarchy nor Christian. We could go all day quoting Marx or Lenin or Chomsky or whoever. Did they support peace or violence or statelessness or a state? Marx even used phrasing that was suspiciously similar to one of the passages we've read from Acts. In his critique of the Gotha program, Marx says, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Sounds like it lines up. But what happens when someone doesn't voluntarily give the amount of what Marx thinks is your ability and their need? Well, he answers that several times with endorsing violence. One time in particular, Marx wrote in The Victory of the Counter-Revolution in Vienna, published in 1848, There is only one way in which the murderous death agonies of the old society and the bloody birth throes of the new society can be shortened, simplified, and concentrated, and that way is revolutionary terror. And even after that, we could also spend all day denouncing things as not real communism, but what it really comes down to is initiating force to create your community. If so, you fit a standard definition of a communist. And that's fine for our discussions, we just need to be honest about it. If you still like the idea of communal living, but completely reject initiating violence, 
you'd be better off using the term voluntarism or even voluntary communism. But if you don the red or hammer and sickle, you are at least inadvertently advocating for violence, and there really isn't any way around that. Okay, my second point, Ananias and Sapphira were not killed for not participating in the commune. They were killed for lying to God. And they were not killed by the apostles. I recently presented my case in episode 37 on why a Christian is not qualified to carry out the death penalty. And even in this case, we do not see an example of Christians or church representatives carrying it out. It clearly states that they were guilty for lying to God. Not that they were guilty for not completely participating in communism. Third, we see possibly two forms of distribution, and neither being a state and what we would call redistribution of wealth. In chapter 2, we see the participants of the distribution described as all the believers, where in chapter 4 and 5, we see the proceeds being laid at the apostles' feet. So here we have either individual charity or charity given to a representative like a church or an organization to then distribute the proceeds. Chapter 6 shows the apostles were a big part of the distribution of the proceeds and the food it must have purchased. And another interesting point, the first verse in chapter 6 tells us, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the Greek Jewish widows and the Hebraic Jewish widows were receiving different amounts of proceeds or assistance, and it was causing some complaints. This causes the 12 apostles to appoint men of good reputations to take over the duties of attending to the community of believers so the apostles can continue to preach. It's also interesting to note, as history always seems to show, regardless of voluntary means or coerced, the distribution becomes problematic. The pilgrims discovered this the hard way as well. I'll try to visit that topic another day, but I hope that helps shed a little light on these passages. Whether you've encountered it before and didn't quite know how to answer it, I hope this helps. If you haven't encountered this objection, it's also my hope that you'll now be ready when it comes around. These passages are a better representation of voluntarism, rather than what's generally regarded as communism. And again, the definitions can vary, but I'd like to look at a section of Walter Block's book, The Case for Discrimination. In it, he fairly and evenly breaks down some differences between communism and what he calls voluntary communism. Voluntary communism, together with laissez-faire capitalism, has nothing to be ashamed of on moral and economic grounds. They can each hold up their heads high. Far from enemies, they are merely opposite sides of the same voluntaristic coin. Together, they must battle state coercion, whether called state capitalism or state socialism. The point is, left versus right is a red herring the reddest and perhaps most misleading red herring in all political economic theory. The true debate is not between left and right. It is rather between voluntarism, whether of left or right, and coercivism, whether of left or right. The sooner this lesson is learned, the sooner we can make sense of our otherwise paradoxical political debates. So as you can see, Voluntary communism isn't at all like communist parties and countries, nor self-proclaimed communist ideologues today. They would take great offense to any relation to or perceived approval of laissez-faire capitalism. Like I mentioned before, if you at all ever support violence to create or maintain your communist society, you do not qualify as this voluntary communism that Bloch describes. 
This is where the term voluntary shows its consistency within this common living. So I'll have links to the verses, additional episodes, and articles that I mentioned in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to Anarcho-Christian Podcast on whatever podcast you're using. If you're not sure where to find us, visit anarchochristian.com slash subscribe. There you'll find links to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Android, Google Play, and YouTube. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider letting us know by leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes or wherever you catch the episodes. Also, like and share the episodes on Facebook and the other social media sites. You can support the show with a monthly donation through Patreon. Thank you, Al, for becoming our newest patron. Visit the support tab on anarchochristian.com. That'll take you to our Patreon page where you'll find a few ways that you can support us. And thank you again, Al, for your financial support. So I think that's it for today. Grace and peace. No King but Christ. Thank you for listening to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast. Subscribe to our email notifications at anarchochristian.com. Like us on facebook.com backslash anarchochristian. And follow us on Twitter at anarchoxp. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube to join us next time as we continue to evaluate the relationship between the Christian and the state. No King But Christ. Libertas Productions Podcast. God said there's a sea.